So it could be more than six seconds. Yeah. Uh, they're going to come in. Yeah. Okay. Good evening and hello, everyone, and welcome to this first keynote session <clears throat> in our conference program. Um, my name is Vincent Hediger. I am a professor of cinema studies at Goethe University Frankfurt, and um, I am technically the project leader of uh, the HERO project, Victor E. And it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce to you someone whose work has been really important for us in working on this project already in the proposed stage, but actually in some of, uh, some of our other projects uh, that we're currently conducting at Goethe University, like Configurations of Film, which is a doctoral program. Um, Jamie Barron has not written the book on our topic. She has written the two books uh, on our topic. Um, the first of which is uh, the archive effect, found footage and the audiovisual experience of history, which was published with Routledge in 2014. And uh, just uh, last year, uh, Jamie published Muse, Misuse, Abuse, the Ethics of Audiovisual Appropriation in the Digital Era, which came out from Rutgers University Press in 2020, and uh, which uh, actually very precisely addresses some of the core um, issues uh, of, of this conference. Um, Jamie Barron graduated um, with a BA in a field of study that I think at Brown no longer exists in this form, uh, namely arts semiotics. Uh, I think it has been replaced with a media program, but that was a distinctive feature of Brown at some point in, in the in the 80s and 90s that they had a semiotics program. And then she moved on to uh, complete her MA in film studies in one of the great schools in our field, uh, Iowa, and uh, earned her PhD in cinema media studies from UCLA in 2010. And she has been an assistant professor um, in the Department of English and Film Studies at the University of Alberta in the cinema media studies program since 2012 and an associate professor um, since 2017. Um, thank you, Jamie, for making yourself available for this keynote, and we're very much looking forward to hearing your talk. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Vincennes. Thank you for that introduction. And also thank you to Lucy for inviting me to speak and to the organizers of the conference for giving me this opportunity. Um, so I'm very excited to present to you today. Um, basically, what I'd like to present is essentially the, the beginning, uh, the theoretical um, framework from my book, Reuse, Misuse, Abuse, um, in the hopes that it will be helpful to, to our discussions. Um, so I am just going to jump right in. Um, so my talk is entitled Appropriating the Archive, the Ethics of Repurposing Found Audiovisual Materials. I'm going to focus to some extent on Canadian um, works, just because that's where, where I'm located, um, but hopefully that it will expand beyond that. All right, so in November 2015, the Montreal International Documentary Film Festival came under fire for including Quebec filmmaker Dominique Gagnon's 74-minute film of the North in its program. Like some of Gagnon's previous films, this film's imagery was appropriated entirely from clips posted on YouTube. In this case, the clips were all shot by or featured Inuit people. The soundtrack was composed of music by Inuk throat singer Tanya Tagak. For neither his use of the images nor the music did Gagnon seek or obtain permission from the YouTube posters or Tagak. The latter publicly called the film racist, demanding her music be removed from the soundtrack and became one of the leaders of a campaign against the film. In response to the film, an Inuk broadcaster named Stephen Puskas began contacting as many of the YouTube subjects as he could locate in order to let them know their images appeared in Gagnon's film. As a result, many asked that their images be removed. Gagnon then began screening a version of the film without music and replaced the images he had been asked to exclude with black. Soon after, Gagnon stopped screening the film altogether and it is now extremely difficult to see in its original form. Nonetheless, Gagnon did not seem to feel he had done anything wrong, claiming in an interview with the Aboriginal People's Television Network that he was the target of criticism simply because, as he put it, 
I am a man and I am white. Inevitably, this conflict led to a discussion among filmmakers, programmers, and commentators about freedom of speech versus the long history of white colonial misrepresentation of indigenous peoples. However, it also raises important questions about the artist's rights and responsibilities when it comes to appropriating recorded sounds and images of other people, particularly in the digital age when so much is so easily available. One of these questions has to do with consent. In fact, one of Gagnon's lines of defense was to argue that the posted footage was already public and therefore fair game. Moreover, Gagnon argued that the film was less about Inuit people than about how people record themselves for platforms like YouTube. He said, quote, to me, it's more a story about how Inuit people appropriate social media, how they represent themselves, what they feel like doing. Thus, in Gagnon's view, because these videos were posted on YouTube, they became not representations of individuals or of a culture, but symptoms of a social media phenomenon. A group of Quebec filmmakers came to Gagnon's defense in an open letter, not so much validating the film itself as the need for freedom of expression and the opportunity to discuss the film, writing that the removal of the film from the Montreal Festival program meant that, quote, the public is deprived of the sin qua non condition for a sound democratic debate, the possibility of determining its own opinion. Despite these defenses, many critics, particularly indigenous viewers, continued to find the film offensive. Inuk documentary filmmaker Althea Arnakuk Baril accused the film of representing Inuit people as, quote, violent, wandering drunks that neglect their children and don't care for the lives of animals. That's the image I took away from the film. I think it's a kind of a cheap move to totally play up a negative stereotype of a marginalized people for your own artistic gain. She noted further that Gagnon clearly selected certain types of clips, choosing to include, for instance, numerous clips of drunken Inuit people. Quote, it's as if he went searching for clips of drunk Inuit or drunk Eskimo. This is a decision he made to portray us this way. He went in with his own perception. It's not a reflection of how Inuit perceive ourselves. At least in Arnakuk Baril's view, Gagnon's particular choice of videos reflected his preconceived ideas about Inuit people. Arnakuk Baril also noted that many of the appropriated images were not self-representations, but rather videos taken without the subject's permission or perhaps even knowledge. Thus, Gagnon's selection of clips in Of the North constituted, at least for many viewers, a harmful misrepresentation of his subjects. Moreover, the sense of skewed representation was not due exclusively to the content of the images, but also to the ways in which Gagnon fitted them together. Gagnon's perspective, as conveyed through both choice of material and editing, is not innocent, but deeply ideological, whether he acknowledges it or not. Two sequences involving laughter are particularly illustrative of this fact. In one, we see a man in long shot beating a small seal to death as the unseen woman behind the camera laughs. In another, we see images of raw sewage pouring into a pristine landscape followed by images of caribou eating the sewage, again, accompanied by laughter. These are upsetting images, no doubt. Yet what is most egregious in these scenes, like many others in the film, is the total lack of contextual information. The juxtaposition of animal harm and these Inuit people's laughter makes the people seem cruel and heartless. However, we have no idea who these people are, nor do we know anything about the conditions under which they are living, let alone the origins of those conditions. Without such information, the inclusion of these sequences suggests that Inuit people commit and record animal cruelty just for fun, which is at very least not the whole story in these videos. By including these sequences and not offering contextual commentary, Gagnon eschews responsibility for their content while nevertheless conveying an extremely negative impression of the people recorded therein. I just realized I didn't, oh, yeah, that's the picture from up the north. Um, thus, the objections to the film are multiple and multifaceted. Not only did Gagnon not seek consent to use the images or sounds he appropriated that raised objections, but he is also a white artist who has never even been to the North, appropriating images of indigenous people. Not only does the content of the appropriated material reflect negatively on its subjects, but the particular way in which Gagnon selected and then edited his appropriated materials together exacerbated the negative misrepresentation of an entire group of people. Not only does he appear to be ignorant of, or at least lacking in critical awareness about existing stereotypes and racist discourses about indigenous people in Canada and beyond, but his film reinforces the unequal relations of power inherited from colonialism, wittingly or no. 
It is in the intersection between these various issues, consent, misrepresentation through selection and editing, and existing power relations, that the ethical question at the heart of this film's production and circulation lies. However, none of these issues can be considered strictly in isolation. Indeed, if the problem of audiovisual appropriation were reduced solely to consent, certain films by indigenous artists that have not been criticized and have even been celebrated might also come under fire. Indigenous filmmaker Kent Monkman's three minute film, Sisters and Brothers from 2015, for example, was one of four films commissioned by the National Film Board of Canada that quote, remix archival footage to address indigenous identity and representation, reframing Canadian history through a contemporary lens. The film begins with written text quoting Native American activist Leonard Peltier saying, hope and resiliency, these are your greatest strengths, sisters and brothers, all of one human family, your generation and mine. The film then cuts to images of grasslands and a group of white cowboys gazing at bison through a mat that connotes binoculars. The images of bison are intercut with images of indigenous children who, it becomes clear, were forcibly taken from their families and placed in what were euphemistically called residential schools, which were designated to assimilate them into white colonial culture. Throughout Monkman's film, montage is used to create a visual, visual metaphor equating the mass slaughter of the bison with the practices of the residential school system that sought to annihilate native culture. The film ends with another title reading, quote, we have recorded the deaths of over 6,000 children while in residential schools. Many were not returned to their families and most were buried in unmarked graves. This quotation is attributed to Justice Murray Sinclair writing on behalf of the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission completed in 2015. Regarding consent, Monkman's film is as potentially problematic as Gagnon's. The unidentified residential school children whose images Monkman appropriated did not give their consent either for the original filming, for the images are clearly taken by advocates of the residential schools who would have had the power to film regardless of the children's wishes, or for the appropriation. Indeed, it would likely have been impossible for Monkman to locate these people who are unnamed and many of whom are probably deceased. Nonetheless, if the ethics of audiovisual appropriation were reduced solely to consent, this would be an unethical appropriation. Yet the fact that Monkman himself is an indigenous filmmaker of Cree ancestry and that his film clearly serves as a critique of the residential school system and a defense of the children who were its victims mitigates the sense that he is violating his subjects' rights. His film is a cry for justice for these children who cannot demand it themselves, and as such, reads to, reads to me as an intensely and actively ethical text. In one image, an unidentified and unlikely unidentifiable indigenous girl in a residential school stares back at the colonial camera and by extension, looks at us across the temporal divide of decades. Her returned gaze asserts her identity and presence, which the colonial Canadian government tried so hard to erase. Monkman's inclusion of this image in his film thereby becomes an act of indigenous reclamation. Thus, I would argue that in the comparison of these two texts, it becomes clear that the ethics of audiovisual appropriation are complex and cannot be reduced to any single variable. Indeed, these are only two examples of a phenomenon that exceeds any attempt to account for all of its possible permutations. As different as they are, Of the North and Sisters and Brothers both gesture towards a much broader practice that has become pervasive in contemporary film and video culture. Segments of pre-existing recordings, of which there is now a seemingly endless accessible supply, have increasingly become the building blocks of new articulations. This remix or read-write culture, in the terms coined in part by Lawrence Lessig, offers opportunities to use recorded sounds and images as a new set of semantic units from which new kinds of previously impossible sentences may emerge. Drawing parallels between written quotation and audiovisual appropriation, Lessig writes, quote, whether text or beyond text, remixes collage, it comes from combining elements of read-only culture. It succeeds by leveraging the meaning created by the reference to build something new. Lev Manovich similarly, similarly defines remix as, quote, a composition that consists of previously existing parts assembled, which is edited to create particular aesthetic, semantic, and or bodily effects. Remix, or what I hear call misuse for reasons that will become clear, enables both the partial retention and simultaneous transformation of the meaning of the original document. Of course, as numer numerous theorists and historians have demonstrated, this kind of practice is not a recent development. 
Quotation of written documents is obviously an ancient practice. Collage has been a fundamental component of visual art since Picasso. And musical sampling has its roots in 1970s Jamaican DJ culture and African-American hip hop. The reuse of pre-existing film footage goes back to the earliest days of cinema. Even as the first films began to circulate, entrepreneurial exhibitors re-edited and repackaged them as new films. Soviet filmmaker Esfir Shub, however, is credited with producing the first compilation film when she made The Fall of the Romanov Dynasty in 1927. By re-editing documentary footage produced by and for former Tsar Nicholas II when he was still in power, she transformed footage honoring the Tsar and his regime into a celebration of their demise. Meanwhile, Joseph Cornell's 1936 Rose Hobart, in which Cornell took the 1931 Hollywood melodrama East of Borneo and retained only, with few ex a few exceptions and additions, the footage including the main actress, Rose Hobart, and then set this re-edited footage to music, is generally regarded as the first experimental found footage film. Meanwhile, the situationist practice of detournement also entailed audiovisual appropriation in order to undermine the power of mass culture. The Situationists made use of elements of popular culture, including photographs, especially advertisements and film footage, in order to disrupt its hegemonic discourse through collage techniques of juxtaposition. Guy Debord and Gil Woolman wrote in 1956 that, quote, when two objects are brought together, no matter how far apart their original context may be, a relationship is always formed. The mutual interference of two worlds of feeling or the juxtaposition of two independent expressions supersedes the original elements and produces a synthetic organization of greater efficacy. In their emphasis on new combinations and the juxtaposition of two independent expressions in order to generate novel relationships and syntheses, de Borden Woolman extended the insights of the Soviet montage theory to the specific revolutionary potentialities of appropriation of pre-existing visual materials. They theorized the potential of detournement as a weapon of class struggle that can reveal the inner workings of capitalism in order to further the socialist revolution. And since the times of Shub and Cornell and the heyday of situationism, the works of numerous experimental film and video makers, along with many musicians and other types of visual artists, have similarly mined pre-existing documents and recordings to produce transformed meanings. Undeniably, however, digital technologies have made pre-existing recordings significantly easier to acquire, re-edit, and manipulate. Indeed, audiovisual appropriation is now a practice in which almost anyone with access to a computer can participate. As a result, millions, if not billions, of internet videos have emerged from this practice. Moreover, digital media has dramatically increased the speed at which such appropriations occur. The same image or sound clip may reappear as an element of multiple texts days, hours, or even minutes after it was produced and posted online. And this art form includes a huge range of practic practitioners. Even as amateurs enthusiastically engage in this practice, professional experimental film and video makers continue to create works in this way. Such makers regularly repurpose pre-existing recordings as a means of commenting on the vast archive of images and sounds that are now available to anyone with a computer and an internet connection. Although these experimental works may have different aims than most YouTube appropriations or memes, what unites both popular appropriation-based memes and experimental found footage works is a clear sense of the subversion of meaning. We are, for the most part, meant to recognize the appropriation, the repurposing, the change in signification. In the face of the frequency and rap rapidity of the circulation, appropriation, and recirculation of these recordings through digital technologies, however, questions arise regarding the ethics of such appropriations, particularly when the recordings in, questions, in question depict actual as opposed to staged fictional events, as Gegnell's of the North and Monkman's sisters and brothers both demonstrate. Although there may be ethical issues raised by the appropriation of staged fictional recordings, the ethics of appropriating actuality recordings is much more fraught. In fictional recordings, we perceive a gap, a gap between the self of the performer and the performance. In actuality recordings, we seem to have access to the person's real self. Of course, the relationship between actuality recordings and the real is complex and involves its own kinds of performance. Um, however, the sense of access to the actual subject is much stronger. And from this sense of proximity stems the urgency of ethical questions regarding their appropriation. As indicated by the examples above, the ethical implications that arise when the documentary's material perceived original meaning and affect are subverted, are subverted are complex and contradictory. My argument is based on the premise that every reuse of a pre-existing recording is on some level a misuse in the sense that its new use was not intended or at least not anticipated by its original producer. 
Indeed, audiovisual appropriations are often compelling precisely because the recordings they find inappropriate appropriate seem to have been misused, intended for another purpose. Recordings which we recognize as having been taken from one context of use and placed in another may carry with them a trace of their earlier intended uses, even as they are now mobilized for a different intent. This recognition of contrasting intentions generates the often fascinating experience on the part of the viewer of what I have elsewhere called intentional disparity. So I talk about that in the archive effect more than I talk about it in the second book. This experience of intentional disparity is based on the perception of a previous intention ascribed to and seemingly inscribed within the appropriated recording that is different than the intention that appears to inform its present use. Of course, we cannot really know the original intention behind the appropriated recording. This would be to invoke the intentional fallacy. Nevertheless, we as viewers of a work of audiovisual appropriation often experience some sense that the appropriated recording is in some fundamental way misused, even if it is only because the original producer of the recording could not have anticipated its use in the present text. Moreover, we often do imagine or project an original intention, even if it cannot ultimately be known. Furthermore, the sense of unintending, unintended meanings may offer us an experience of epiphany or even revelation. Sometimes a significant social or political critique may arise from the play of intended and unintended meanings. And this may make the misuse appear to be worth the ethical cost that derives in particular from the appropriation and reuse of actuality recordings, or not. Indeed, I choose the term misuse precisely because it registers the presence or at least possibility of ethical dilemmas and negotiations inherent in the form. Whereas the term remix expresses a, or remix or reuse expresses a neutral value, uh, use and mixing are neither good nor bad, and theorizations of detournement actively and exclusively celebrate its revolutionary potential. The term misuse indicates ambivalence. This does not mean that every misuse is nece necessarily unethical. In fact, there are many instances of productive misuse of actuality recordings that, although they may generate an ethical disturbance, may nevertheless seem justified. However, as I shall talk about more, there are instances in which the misuse may shade into abuse, generating a feeling that the appropriation violates our ethical standards in some way. Watching certain works of audiovisual appropriation, we may feel like we are participating in an act of exploitation, of voyeurism and or mockery, an experience that forces us to acknowledge the power relations involved in the act of audiovisual appropriation. While numerous studies and discussions have focused on the legalities of the appropriation of, of appropriation in terms of copyright, I'm not interested in the notion of intellectual property or ownership. Rather, I start with the fact that legally or not, makers are appropriating existing content and thus attempts to account for some of the specifically ethical ramifications of these appropriations as they are occurring. In particular, I am concerned with the ethics vis-a-vis -vis those subjects who are inscribed in the recordings and to some degree vis-a-vis -vis the audience. Bill Nichols has written extensively about the question of the ethical responsibilities of the documentary film or video maker in relation to his or her film subjects. Drawing on the concept of axiology, the study of values, he suggests the neologism axiographics in which he argues, which he argues, quote, may address the question of how values, particularly in ethics of representation, comes to be known and experienced in relation to space. In Nichols' analysis, our sense of ethics is often based in our perception of the location of the maker in relation to his or her subject, and by implication, the construction of the viewer's relation to the film subjects who become the objects of our gaze. He argues that the camera inscribes the ethical stance of the documentary maker vis-a-vis -vis her subject, writing, quote, an, index an indexical bond exists between the image and the ethics that produced it. The image gives evidence of the politics and ethics of its maker. In other words, as viewers, we read an ethics of the documentary maker, maker in the images he or she has filmed, and we do so through an evaluation of the maker's stance, literal and figurative, toward the film subjects. The notion of axiographics, however, rests to some degree on the assumption that the film or video maker was at some point in the presence of the film subject, choosing the angle, angle from which to shoot, deciding whether or not to be present on screen, and so on. The appropriationist, however, operates an, at an additional spatial and potentially personal and emotional remove that I argue further complicates our ethical evaluation. Indeed, this spatial remove intensifies a number of ethical issues already present in documentary production. Whereas the documentary maker often acquires some degree of ethical standing by having been there with the film subjects, the appropriationist, in most cases, 
never comes into direct contact with any of the subjects. This raises the question, what gives the appropriationist the right to take these sounds or images out of context, a phrase that has come to harbor immediately negative associations to exploitation and or deception? Beneath this question lies the assumption that appropriationists may feel less of a responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the original subjects, a literally irresponsible attitude potentially encouraged by the easy access to materials afforded by online digital archives and databases and their seemingly anonymous origins. In one of the few existing essays devoted to the ethics of audiovisual appropriation, Thomas L. Sasser describes a shift from analog film production to digital post-production as follows, quote, Whereas analog filmmaking centered on production seeks to capture reality in order to harness it into a representation, digital filmmaking conceived from post-production proceeds by way of extracting reality in order to harvest it. Instead of disclosure and revelation, post-production treats the world as data to be processed or mined as raw materials and resources to be exploited." End quote. The term El Sasser chooses to describe audiovisual appropriation, data to be processed and resources to be exploited, imply an anxiety and perhaps pessimism about the ethical implications of this form of production, or as he puts it, post-production, suggesting that the world, and by implication, the people in it, may become simply a series of objects to be manipulated without the appropriationist or the viewer having any sense of responsibility to that world or to those people. Moreover, as suggested above, the question of the subject's consent may quickly arise. Of course, the notion of informed consent has long been a standard for regulating documentary filmmaking more generally. As John Stuart Katz and Judith Milstein Katz note in a pioneering documentary anthology dedicated to image ethics, quote, voluntary and informed consent is required if the filmmaker is to be considered as having acted ethically. Cats and cats detail many of the problems linked to obtaining truly informed consent, which is far from simple. Simple. However, whereas documentarians must generally obtain at least some kind of signed release from their subjects, audiovisual appropriation often involves the use of materials without any form of consent. Subjects are rarely even informed of the reuse. If the consent of the subjects is taken as constitutive of an ethical use of a recording, then the appropriationist gesture appears unethical almost by its very definition. In fact, one common response to the anxiety about people's images and voices being appropriated without limitation is to suggest that these people must give their informed consent for any audiovisual appropriation. Lawyer Laurel Babwa, writing within the United States legal context about the 2010 song and video entitled The Bed Intruder Song, produced by the Gregory Brothers, has argued that Antoine Dodson, the man whose voice and image was appropriated for the song and video, should have the right to sue the Gregory Brothers for violating his right to publicity. Although he agreed to participate in the original news broadcast that the Gregory Brothers appropriated, he never gave his permission for this broadcast footage to be used in the Bed Intruder Song. J. Thomas McCarthy defines the right to publicity as, quote, the inherent right of every human being to control the commercial use of his or her identity. Drawing on Dodson's example, Baba suggests that images of private individuals as well as celebrities should have the legal right to sue anyone who appropriates their image and profits from the appropriation in any way. Although this legal argument is persuasive on an affective level, given that few of us would like our image or recorded voice to be reused with impunity without our explicit consent, the implication is that audiovisual appropriation as an art form and as social commentary would be drastically curtailed. Moreover, there are numerous problems with requiring explicit consent as the criterion for an ethical audiovisual appropriation. What should a maker do when the film subjects are now dead, are no longer compus mentis, or simply cannot be found? Is such material then a priori off limits? More importantly, perhaps, are there not cases where a subject might, for self-interested reasons, deny permission to use a recording that could be used in the service of attaining justice for someone else? Does the social value of certain potential uses of a given recording ever exceed the recorded subject's right to control it? Indeed, despite El Sasser's proposition that audiovisual appropriation cannot disclose or reveal, he simultaneously acknowledges its potential for disclosure and revelation, particularly in cases when the original maker is revealed as ethically suspect in some way. In his analysis of Harun Faroqi's Aufschub from 2007, in which Faroqi appropriates and self-reflexively interrogates footage shot at the Westerbork transit camp for Dutch and German Jews bound for Auschwitz, El Sasser suggests that there are audiovisual appropriations that we may deem actively ethical, attempting to in some small way acknowledge the rights of the people in these images whose rights were so violently disregarded. 
Likewise, in Sisters and Brothers, the indigenous children who are objectified by the colonial camera are given an opportunity to look back and become active subjects in Monkman's film. El Sasser takes important steps towards theorizing particular instances of audiovisual appropriation he deems ethical. However, I would argue that the precise process by which we as viewers may evaluate the ethics of a given appropriation remains opaque. Philosopher Martha Nussbaum suggests that the ethical is deeply intertwined with lived experience. Ethics are not a fixed set of rules and they cannot be divorced from actual lived encounters. She distinguishes the ethical from the moral by identifying the, the essential ethical question as how should one live? She writes, quote, this question does not assume that there is a sphere of moral values that can be separated off from all the other practical values that figure into a human life. What they who seek an ethical life are asking is not what is the good out there, but what can we best live by and live together as social beings? Although Nussbaum's analyses generally focus on literature, her work is relevant to film as well. In the contemporary world, if we are to live together as social beings, we must think through how we wish to look at and listen to one another through our recorded images and voices. As viewers, we must constantly assess what we are looking at and or listening to and how we are being asked to look at and listen to it by a film or video and to decide whether that is a position we wish to take up. Moreover, in the deluge of recorded sounds and imagery that circulate and recirculate, repositioning us again and again in relation to others on screen, this assessment must be constant and vigilant. Another implication of the Nussbaum quote above, however, is that no external system exists for distinguishing once and for all the ethical from the unethical. Indeed, one of the challenges of discussing the ethics of audiovisual appropriation, like the ethics of any practice, lies in the fact that because ethical evaluations depend to some degree on individual values, orientations, and situations, there is no objective way to determine what counts as ethical and what does not. Sarah Cooper suggests, following um, Emmanuel Levinas, that, quote, an ethics is produced through the encounter rather than pre-existing it. In the end, it falls on the individual viewer in the moment of encounter with the text to determine whether he or she deems a given act of appropriation ethical. However, this determination is necessarily based on shared cultural mores. There are certain kinds of appropriations most viewers are likely to feel are justified while others are not. Yet precisely because they derive from shared cultural values, ahistorical, are not rigid, rigid and ahistorical, but are rather socially situated and historically specific. Thus the rise of digital technologies may be changing what sorts of audiovisual practices we consider ethical. Nichols aptly notes that quote, Ethics can be said to be an ideological mechanism by which those in power propose to regulate their own conduct. As viewers in the digital era situated in a position of spectatorial power, we must decide based on shared but malleable cultural values, what sort of spectatorial acts we wish, we wish to participate in. I suggest that close attention to the cognitive and affective experience of watching works of audiovisual appropriation may offer some clarification regarding their ethics. In order to further elucidate this experience, we must first ask, how do we understand the ethic ethical responsibility of the maker who appropriates rather than directly records actuality materials vis-a-vis -vis those represented in the image or sound recordings? What kinds of intellectual embodied and affective effects may audiovisual appropriations generate for us as viewers? And what are the structures through which we evaluate the ethics of these effects? Nichols notes that there is always a cost to what he calls epistophilia, the desire to know. The misuse of documentary materials always involves an additional cost. I seek to determine the structures by which we as viewers may decide whether the potential for knowledge or some other kind of experience exceeds that cost. I argue that when it comes to the audiovisual appropriation of actuality recordings, it is through an interrogation of the complex interplay between three things, our sense of the rights of those recorded, our projection of the intentions of the producer of the original document and our reading of the intentions embedded in the act of appropriation that must determine our ethical evaluation. Moreover, there is an overarching structure that I will argue contributes to our ethical encounter with a work, our ethical encounter with a work of appropriation, which I refer to as the layered gaze. The gaze in watching a documentary recording is always already layered, the gaze of the maker overlaid by that of the viewer. Often we do not notice this layering, identifying our gaze unconsciously with that of the maker. However, if our own affective response to the film subject seems to contradict those of the maker, 
we may experience a sense of alienation, a feeling that we have been or else wish to be expelled by the film and its gaze, which becomes suddenly visible as a figure. When I watch Mondo Kane, for instance, a film that catalogs bizarre practices from quote unquote bizarre practices from around the world with the aim of shocking the white Western audience, I am aware of the mocking, objectifying and often colonialist gaze of the makers. I squirm in my seat, I look away, wishing to distance myself from the filmmakers demeaning perspective on the people they filmed. However, the potential for these contradictions is literally multiplied in the case of audiovisual appropriation. Indeed, I would argue that appropriation of previously recorded material creates a multi layered structure based on our perceptions of the film subject of the ethical stance of the original maker toward her material and of the ethical stance of the maker who has appropriated this material editing and reframing its images and sounds to a new end. It is the relation between these three perceptions that will determine whether we read the reuse as ethical. But when this layered gaze is in effect, what precisely determines whether a viewer will read a particular reuse of a particular found image as ethical or not? In her Phenomenology of the Ethical Gaze, Vivian Sobchak performs a semiotic phenomenology of the filming of actual human death. She notes that, quote, in the indexical representations of documentary, the very act of vision which makes the representation of death possible is itself subject to moral scrutiny. She further notes that codes such as camera shake, framing, distance, and duration may serve to justify the filming of a real death, constituting our perception of the filmmaker's gaze through these codes. She then delineates a series of documentary gazes entailed in the filming of an actual death, which seem to justify this filming an act that might otherwise be regarded as unethical. The gazes she identifies as ethical include the accidental gaze, the helpless gaze, the endangered gaze, the interventional gaze, and the humane gaze. In other words, the maker may accidentally record the death, may be helpless to prevent the death, may herself be endangered in the situation, may attempt to intervene to prevent the death, or may record an image of death out of compassion for the dying, all of which seem to justify the filming of indexical documentary death. Given that the act of appropriation always occurs at a remove, however, the appropriationist who wished to reuse an image of real death does not share the situation with her film subject. Hence, she is not in the same danger. Being in a different space and time, she is helpless in that she cannot intervene, but this does not justify the appropriation because she can choose whether or not to appropriate these images. Her appropriation is deliberate and cannot be excused as accidental. In fact, it is only the humane gaze or a version of it that may persist in the act of appropriation. Sobchak writes that, quote, the humane gaze visibly and significantly encodes in the image its own subjective responsiveness to what it sees. She suggests, for instance, that sustained duration is one of the formal elements that visibly and significantly encodes the humane gaze. This sense of encoded subjective responsiveness is deeply relevant to the reading of the ethics of audiovisual appropriation. However, in works of appropriation, the subjective responsiveness must be encoded both in the choice of existing material and in the editing, which includes not only the ordering of images and sounds, but also reframing, masking, superimposing, and so on. In other words, whereas in the act of filming, the filmmaker's gaze is encoded in the cinematography, in the case of, the, of appropriation, the appropriationist gaze is constituted primarily through the appropriationist selection and editing of the found recording. Of course, the demand for subjective responsiveness does not apply only in relation to images of death. Indeed, when it comes to appropriation, there are many kinds of recordings whose misuse seems to demand a subjective responsiveness on the part of the appropriationist. Otherwise, the viewer may experience the appropriation, which is always already a transgression, as an intolerable one. A feeling of transgression may arise, for instance, when a found recording we read as having been intended strictly for a private or limited audience of an intimate or personal nature, for instance, is used in a public documentary. So, for instance, the appropriation of home movies. Even if these recordings, even if recordings of these activities exist, if we understand that they were addressed only to a particular audience, members of one family, perhaps, it may seem like an ethical violation for a maker to appropriate them for widespread display raising questions of voyeurism and violation of privacy. However, the sense of transgression may be mitigated, at least in, in part, by our sense of the subjective responsiveness of the appropriationist, how she or he chooses to edit and thereby reframe these private recordings and to what end. <clears throat> 
By the same token, there are works of appropriation that actively undermine any sense of subjective responsiveness. And this sometimes constitutes an ethical gesture in that it serves the fun function of critique. For instance, when the appropriation of the image or voice of a powerful political figure is appropriated in the service of political critique, this may appear to belong to the tradition of political satire, which we generally understand as an integral aspect of freedom of expression within a democratic setting. When the critique serves to disrupt hegemonic media forms that, for instance, exclude minority identities and experiences, this also serves the function of social criticism. Yet the ethics of such a critical gaze depends on our perception of the target of the mockery and the power relations between the appropriationist and the appropriated subject. When this mocking gaze is aimed at a different kind of subject, it can serve reactionary functions. It's humor disguising discrimination based on race, gender, sexuality, class, ability, and so on. In such instances, the absence of subjective responsiveness may be perceived as an ethical failure. Thus, the concept of the layered gaze may help us art to articulate these complex relationships that ultimately inform our ethical evaluation of the appropriation. I must also note that while subjects articulation of the gaze in relation to ethics is extremely useful, its focus on the visual elides the importance of audio experience. In English, there is no audio term that is parallel to gaze, a fact that has been a, a source of great frustration for me. Nevertheless, I want to emphasize that the layered gaze is also often a layered act of listening as well. Because the sense of what constitutes an ethical appropriation ultimately depends on the individual viewer, she must perform a complex, if not explicitly thought out, evaluation of multiple ethical layers. Through this layered act of viewing and listening, she must decide for herself if the strategies and ends justify the misuse of pre-existing documents. The appropriated other, though seemingly distanced from us in space and time, is nevertheless our responsibility. As viewers who look and listen and like and share, we can hide neither behind the screen on which we watch the image, nor the excuse, deployed by Gagnon among many others, that the recording was already out there. In looking and listening, we are complicit. Thus, we must at least attempt to become aware of this complicity so that we may actively decide to what degree we are willing to be party to a given misuse. Although legal means are too blunt a tool for regulating audiovisual appropriation, which is a complex, rich, and generative form, we must, we must nonetheless continually pose the question of, as Nussbaum puts it, what values can we best live by so as to live together as social beings? Or in other words, in a digitized media landscape in which all of our images and voices are potentially up for grabs, we must ask, how can we best live with ourselves? Thank you. Well, thank you, um, Jenny, for this extremely nuanced and, and helpful uh, discussion, which I particularly appreciate because it, uh, ultimately it is not normative, but uh, what you propose is a, is a heuristic, you know, based in a, in a profound respect for the material and the um, individual situations um, uh, with which we are dealing. I just want to remind the audience that if you have questions, you should send them by email to victoryprog um, at gmail.com, victory.prog at gmail.com, and we will collect them in writing and um, uh, can enter discussion at any time that you like. Um, as I was listening to you, Jamie, I, I was, I was uh, trying to think of examples uh, uh, films where potentially one could have had this type of discussion, maybe should have had it, but it didn't happen. Um, and so I was sort of interested in the negative conditions for, uh, for those ethics or cases in which, you know, that does, didn't seem to be an issue. And one example that came to mind is Kevin B. Lee's famous uh, Transformers remake, uh, desktop documentary. I don't know if you, if you know that is sort of the mother of all video essays. Yeah, uh, I, just, I have seen at least parts of it. <laughs> so basically, what it is is it, it's a, a making of the Transformers compiled from amateur footage um, shot in the various locations by bystanders and uploaded uh, to YouTube. 
and and it proposes an analysis of the global production, you know, the runaway production system of Hollywood and the way they let me be blown suck up to the Chinese in order to be able to um, uh, enter the Chinese market. And all of that is reconstructed just from footage found on YouTube. And it, it is quite clear that uh, Kevin didn't go through the trouble of obtaining permission to use that material, which, you know, you could say people uh, freely uploaded that material and didn't care so much. And uh, if anyone's rights were infringed upon, it was probably Hollywood. Um, but it, uh, I thought it was interesting that that type of discussion, the, the image ethics discussion, even though it is clearly marked as a documentary, didn't happen in that, in that film. Um, so I was wondering if you had any thoughts on cases that should have been a scandal but weren't, um, and, mm. and why? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, I, I tried to, uh, in my book, cover most of the ones that I felt were kind of liminal cases, you know, that was what I was most interested in were the, the places where um, there was a real question, you know, I mean, there's some that are clearly abusive and others that seem relatively benign, right? But um, I certainly focused mostly on those that seem to tread the line between the two. Um, I mean, in the case of the Transformers essay, I mean, I'd have to look at it again to comment intelligently about it. But, you know, I mean, it all sort of depends on how we perceive, you know, what the, the what that original gaze was, right? Was it just, you know, some people like, oh, hey, there's a Hollywood production going on, I'm just going to shoot it. And then, you know, um, Kevin Lee is using it for analytical purposes, which you may seem as see as justified, um, you know, and it, you know, again, this depends on the individual viewer to some degree in making that evaluation. Um, but I think you're right that in that case, I mean, the, the, the people who are being represented are, are Hollywood stars or Hollywood workers. Um, and depending on how you understand the power relations there, I mean, how Hollywood generally has a lot of power. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, you know, if, if they're filming, you know, workers who just are trying to do their job on the set, then those power relations become more complex, right? So it might depend on even individual uh, videos within the video essay may have different ethics in terms of their appropriation. Absolutely. I mean, the, the overall discourse, of course, the, the, this was a critical view of, of, of Hollywood and Hollywood's power and the kind of global power kind that they're playing. So it, it is an example that ties in with, with uh, the last case that you discussed, where there is a clear power differential and where, you know, the, the people portrayed or the people whose images are appropriated uh, or, you know, have such a powerful social position that they really shouldn't, shouldn't complain, so to speak. Um, the, the other uh, um, question that went through my mind um, as I was listening to you is more directly related to, to our own research in Victory. E. Um, and it has to do with the fact that uh, most of the material that we're working with, of course, is historical material and it concerns people and portrays people whose consent it would be impossible to obtain because obviously they're no longer alive. And um, and that still has an ethical dimension. So you sort of have to enter into dialogue with people who cannot respond and you have to, um, uh, in, in a way, speak for them. Or, so I was interested in having your views of that on that particular ethical challenge in dealing with historical material. I yeah, mean, absolutely. You addressed some of it in, in, in one of the earliest, uh, earlier Inuit uh, examples, um, uh, but it remains, it remains a, a big question in, in what we do. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons that I included that image um, of the, the Tulsling Genocide Museum um, exhibit at the end of the PowerPoint, because, you know, I mean, it, those people are dead um, and there is, there is an ethical violation potentially in using their images. I mean, those are also perpetrator images, right? Um, so not only are the people dead, but they certainly didn't give their permission to have their photographs taken um, and they had no, no control really at, at any point. Um, uh, and yet, you know, there are ethical and unethical. I mean, it's a spectrum, I guess, but uh, of, of uses for those um, those images, right? I mean, you can't get their permission. So I don't think, I, mean, I 
argument is that consent as a criteria criterion at least yeah. as a sole criterion it just doesn't work right it's it's not enough um but you know those images can be used as a you know to memorialize those people to draw attention to the cambodian genocide so that people can bear witness right um but there was a recent uh, event that i'm not sure if people heard about where um an irish artist um, took those photographs and digitally manipulated them to colorize them and also make the people look like they are smiling mm -hmm. um and there was it was these images were published in vice magazine which you know it's not a particularly reputable uh publication but you know they, they were published um and there was a you know cambodian government was extremely upset and the Rifi pan commented on it i mean there, there was a lot of um, anger about this particular uh reuse right because what what's the what's the justification for that kind of manipulation i mean these people were murdered uh they didn't give their consent either for the um photographs to be taken to be appropriated to be digitally manipulated so that they're no longer even referential. Um, and there's so many different problems. It also, it's also misleading to the audience, which is another aspect of ethics that I didn't get into too much um, in this talk. But um, you know, there's some appropriations where the change in signification is very clear. And so therefore, you know, we can make an assessment of those two different gazes potentially, right? We know that we can see the layered gaze, it's, it's explicit. Whereas with digital manipulation, sometimes you can't see it. So you think, you know, that, that the layering becomes invisible and then ethics becomes, uh, the evaluation of the ethics becomes either impossible or certainly more difficult. Yeah. Um, let's go to questions from the audience. We have one uh, to start off with. Uh, it comes from Shabnam Subdev, and uh, it concerns the making the current the, 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 the making of a personal hybrid documentary using archival family footage filmed by Shabnam um, personally. And uh, the question is how you assess the ethical dilemma of using. Um, family footage that the author shoots uh, herself or himself in, in a film like this? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I've thought a lot about that because, you know, I think the sort of gut response would be, well, they're your family photos or you, you shot the footage, even if it's stuff that you've had in the closet for a long time, right? Or just, you know, that you haven't looked at for a long time. Um, and, you know, I think generally speaking, uh, that does not seem like a ethically problematic move, but it can be, right? Um, it depends on the content of those images. It depends on, um, you know, I mean, the something like capturing the Freedmen's, right? That's family footage, but it's extremely disturbing family footage, right? So it's not children's birthday parties. It's, uh, you know, people having breakdowns and things like that. Um, I've, I've thought about the question of whether you can of commit an ethical violation against your past self, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, if yeah. you uh, shot something and you shot it just as a video diary and you thought no one would ever watch this except you, but then you in the future comes and reuses it for something very public, is that an ethical violation? I mean, I think it's a relatively small one because it's you, it's your choice, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's still there. Um, I think, I mean, that, that's part of what I've come to understand about found footage is that there's always an ethical issue. That's why it's always a misuse. Um, mm -hmm. But sometimes it's relatively minor. And, and then it also, of course, depends on what are you using it for, right? If you're using it to explore something important, whatever that would be, um, then it may seem justified. If you're doing it to make fun of your family, I don't know, you know, like maybe not. <laughs> um, so it really depends on how we understand that the gaze of the original again, and then the gaze of the appropriation even if it's the same person's gaze. Right, right. I mean, it, it depends on who in the family is making the film and whose footage uh, they're using. And, and if, you know, for instance, this is a case that Roger Jordan, for instance, in his work in family film uh, discusses extensively. If you um, use family footage, the problem is if, if, if there are your children in there um, and you're using it while they're still children, um, 
there's a problem with consent and you can create trauma um, somewhere further down the road. So it is, it is obviously a very, very important. Um, mm -hmm. ethical, uh, yeah, I was thinking about, I don't know if people watch the um, recent uh, documentary series about uh, Mia Farrow and uh, Dylan Farrow and Woody Allen. Um, but there's the footage of Dylan Farrow talking about being abused um, and it was filmed when she was seven. Um, and there's a really kind of complex question about using that footage, right? I mean, I think she did give her consent as a grown up to, for that to be used in the documentary because she's a participant in the making of the documentary. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's some pretty intense footage of a seven year old who could not really consent, you know, from the past, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't see it as a huge ethical problem. Again, I think it's sort of a call for justice and, you know, and she, she wants to be heard. Um, but, you know, it's the footage itself is still, it's, sort of, there's, a, there's a sense of ethical violation there that again, it can be justified, but it's not absent. Yeah, I mean, this is a, a thorny case, but, but obviously the, the, the footage of the child speaking about that experience is being used to validate um, the claim where, uh, you know, as we know from the legal history of that case, the, the, the abuse was never legally proven. Mm -hmm. uh, so right. it's sort of a, a, a reenactment of the, of, of the legal process. Of the, of the, right. um, let me see. Do we have more questions from, from the audience? I mean, one of the things you also talk about it, but probably, probably you can say a bit more about it, the layered case and the layered hearing. Um, sound obviously is very important in, in establishing uh, perspective and in, in framing, framing uh, arch archival footage. Uh, one of the examples that um, I always think about in this context is, is the footage of Hitler inspecting um, troops in his garden, which appears in Michael Rom's The Ordinary Fascism, um, with a musical accompaniment that turns this into a comedy. So it, it seems like a slapstick film. But um, in German television documentaries, this footage has been amply reused in you know, those Middlebrough, what kind of person was Hitler documentaries that were very popular about 20 years ago. And there the music framing was entirely different. It was actually, it sort of served to legitimize Hitler as the, the leader of his troops or as the commander of his troops. And, and what's interesting about it is that Michael Rom, of course, found this footage and was the first one to use it because it had. Um, uh, being removed from Berlin by the Red Army after the war and, and only survived in Moscow archives. So German television only could use that footage because the Russians had uh, stowed it away in, in, in Moscow and came back from there. It was reappropriated for a very uh, different purpose and, and tonality. So uh, sound is, is, has, also has a very important um, ethical dimension. Uh, and music in particular. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, the example you're talking about, I mean, it, I mean, the, the issue of comedy is really interesting because, um, you know, I think there are times when comedy can be used in an ethical way, right, as a form of critique, mm -hmm. um, as a way of, you know, mocking power or undermining power. But at the same time, it can also make light of something serious, right? That should be taken seriously. And I think that's that's a sort of a, a tough case, right? Because do we read that particular appropriation as undermining Hitler, mocking him, you know, kind of uh, undercutting whatever residual authority he might have, those sorts of things, um, or as somehow making light of the terrible things that he did, right? Um, mm. It's And that's the thing, is it, it may read differently to different viewers as well. So then we get to that question of like, how do we have a consistent um, kind of ethical framework? I mean, the, the framework I've come up with is intended to be very flexible um, because I think it's 
so hard to come up with any hard and fast rules for you know, evaluating ethics, right? I mean, it's going to depend on the perception of these different gazes by individual viewers to some degree. And we may agree on them to an extent. Um, you know, I mean, some footage is clearly perpetrator footage and there are certain ways that I think you can use that footage and have it be deemed ethical at least by the majority of people, viewers, um, and others that are not. But then, you know, there's other cases where it's much harder to say, you know, this is clearly a violation or not. Mm. Um, I mean, one question here is not just to, I mean, what, what you're providing us with is an analytics to determine the specific ethical valences, if you will, of a, of a given image and a, and a communicative uh, situation. Um, but one underlying assumption is that it is always possible to obtain a consensus about um, what, what the proper way of looking at the image and using it would be. Um, we seem to be living at times when that is not always still possible where uh, normative uh, orders seem to have fractured and uh, people take delight in transgressing those norms and, mm -hmm. you know, make it the source of not moral enjoyment, but, but, you know, enjoying their power or whatever it is to see other people suffer. Um, and the question is how you address a situation like that. I mean, how, how are you going to regulate um, uh, these kinds of abuses if they're consciously and willingly perpetrated and um, uh, done so and sometimes in some cases even for enjoy. Yeah, I mean that's why uh, so in my last the last chapter of my book which is called abusing images um, mm -hmm. I talk a bit about a uh, well, number of texts but one of them is uh, Anne Frank memes that are you know, mocking the yeah. murder of a child, right? Um, which seems to me, and I think probably most people that I know, um, to be unethical, like clearly unethical. That is not um, an ethical way to treat the image of a murdered child, um, you know, for, for humor. But, you know, what I came up against is that you, we have different, I mean, ethics are defined by communities. And when you're talking about sort of online communities of trolls, the ethics are totally different if you can even call them ethics. I mean, to me, they don't really read as ethics, but to them, I suppose they do, right? I mean, the, the biggest crime it seems among trolls is to be offended, right? Um, that that is what one cannot, what is unbearable is the idea that anything is, is beyond, uh, not even beyond the pale, but that one should, stop at any point in terms of uh, one's treatment of other people. And I don't know what to do with, with those mm -hmm. communities, right? I mean, I think that uh, among filmmakers and scholars and people, I mean, I think it's important to try to articulate um, at least a framework, a kind of best practices for thinking about the ethics of audiovisual appropriation. Mm -hmm. But there are plenty of people who will never adhere to that, right? I don't think you know, we're never going to regulate, uh, you know, Reddit trolls. That's not, <laughs> that's not going to happen. Um, so I think it just becomes a matter of uh, articulating an ethics for those who believe in who are willing to have one. Yeah. What's that? But yeah, who are willing to have one. But, but in a way, it, it, to a certain extent, I, uh, I, I have to correct my own previous assumption because there is one way in which um, offensive, uh, speech of this kind or offensive uses of images of this kind um, are framed with a different ethics that has a universalist um, claim, and that's the ethics of free speech. Um, so there's a lot of that free speech rhetoric, you know, and we're, we're going through a phase in German universities where there are people usually sort of from the right wing spectrum um, invite people to give talks at universities that they know it's the Richard Spencer situation or the Milo Yiannopoulos situation where they know that there's going to be an outcry and 
Um, they're also doing it to, to sort of test the boundaries of legitimate scientific discourse. They invite people who are clearly quacks and, and, and not serious scientists in the name of, you know, allowing debate and, and um, uh, creating room for controversial ideas. And, and that is a very strong ethical framework. And obviously it is driven by certain uh, power differentials and, and certain interests, but, but um, you cannot deny that they're trying to build an ethical stance. Right, although, I mean, my, I mean, this, this moves away from appropriation, but uh, I mean, my stance on that is, I mean, there's a, a conflation of freedom of speech with the freedom to have, uh, you know, a, an enhanced platform for mm -hmm. one's speech, right? Um, I think there's, you know, there's the allowing for speech and then there's the endorsing of speech and those are different things, right? I don't, I mean, you know, the, the irony of, you know, what's her face, the Marjorie Taylor Greene, you know, mm -hmm. on the, the floor of the Senate speaking into a microphone with a mask that said censored over her mouth, you know, I mean, just the, the, the absurdity that she has this platform, she can say and do whatever she wants. And yet, um, you know, she feels somehow that she deserves a total, you know, not just freedom of speech, but kind of the she deserves, you know, universal amplification of speech, right? And that, that's just, those are different things. Um, so. Yeah, I was just thinking that, that in a way with, with images and appropriated images, we're in a, in a more um, legally and ethically regulated space than in, in a situation like that, because people do have a right to their own image. And, and uh, you know, you, you can take people to court for, for abuses of, of these images. So <laughs> you're more protective um, if you're on, on, you know, if there's a visual record of you, um, then, then in some cases outside, uh, outside of a, a different situation. We have two more questions. Um, this is from Yiman Wong, uh, Santa Cruz. I know Yiman. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to read the question out because it's a bit long and complex and um, I don't want to paraphrase it. I love your concept of the layered gaze as a way of unpacking the complicated power inequities through history. My question is, what does this, uh, what does it take for a privileged maker, such as a white male settler colonialist, to ethically misuse footage about the disenfranchised? Conversely, how would an underprivileged maker involve themselves in the layer case? That's a really good question and probably deserves a whole other book. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I feel like for me, the, the gaze of the film or video or the artwork is not always identifiable entirely with the maker. Um, so that's why, you know, I, I tried to think of it in terms of sort of an adjective, right? Um, as a, you know, a reclamatory or reparatory gaze, right? In relationship to perpetrator images that were, uh, you know, violating somebody's rights, right? Um, because I, I didn't, I don't want to argue that like certain kinds of people can make, can make certain kinds of films or, you know, do certain appropriations and it can be ethical um, while others can't. But with that said, I, I, I wrote about uh, Dana Schutz's use of um, uh, the Emmett Till photograph uh, you know, for her, her painting open casket. And that was an example where she shouldn't have done that. She didn't understand that image and what the image meant to African-American communities, um, what the appropriation would mean. Um, and it mattered that her gaze was a white gaze. Um, and that, you know, her gaze as a, an appropriationist was coded through her whiteness and her privilege. So, you know, I think it's a really complicated question. Um, and I certainly think that, you know, somebody like Dominique Gagnon, I mean, he just, he shouldn't have made that film, right? It just, it wasn't his to make essentially. Um, but on the other hand, I don't think it's entirely impossible that, you know, a straight white man in a position of power 
could make an ethical film um, with those materials. I just would be skeptical about that happening. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I just, I think it's really, really complicated. I think that you can uh, be in a position of power, you know, privileged position um, and use footage of marginalized people in an ethical way, but one would have to be so incredibly careful um, that I, I would, you know, I, I would be very concerned um, what, with that happening. I think yeah. That's a really important analytical distinction, you know, that the gaze is not the empirical person. Right. Uh, which is also why Gagnon was able to protest against the assessment of his film, uh, even though ultimately it is easy to uphold. Uh, uphold but but um, this is different. Um, uh, Yimon was also asking for the other perspective, the, the, the how would a non-privileged maker involve themselves in the way of any case? That is much easier, actually, um, for me to answer. I, I had a chapter where I was really trying to talk about um, appropriation as a you know disruption of hegemonic gazes of different kinds, right? Whether that's a white gaze or a colonial gaze or a male gaze, um, a straight gaze, all of those sorts of things. Um, and there are a lot of artists, I think, who work in that mode, right? Um, so I wrote about Christopher Harris's work um, where he's appropriating uh, ethnographic footage of African peoples as well as recordings of Zora Neale Hurston and doing some really interesting work with that to kind of, um, yeah, intervene in that original gaze, which does is encoded with this colonialism and uh, you know a certain marginalization, at least of certain groups of of black people. Um, and then um, I wrote about uh, uh, Greg Humans and Chris Vargas made this great film uh, that is a uh, it's an appropriation of reality TV um, where they're sort of unveiling they insert themselves into uh, this reality TV show. Um, which is sort of about uh, the creation of queer art and they reveal through their presence in the film how the, you know, kind of the, the queerness that, you know, on this reality TV show is very much, you know, uh, tailored to a straight gaze and they kind of queer that great gaze um, through their appropriation. So I think there's a lot of ways in which, um, you know, people speaking, use appropriation to speak back to power, right? To disrupt those hegemonic gazes with a different gaze. Um, so that I see as, uh, you know, having huge potential um, as an activist tool and just as a way of making people aware of the ideological groundings of certainly mainstream media, um, but also other other problematic power relations that um, sort of are embedded in that original gaze. Uh, so I, I, you know, again, I mean, that that's the thing is that the power relations is in some ways the, the wild card in um, a, a evaluating ethics, because the thing I found, you know, even once I uh, sort of landed on the idea of the layered gaze, and the, the relationship between these different kinds of gazes, it's like, it, it's never, the, the ethics are still not consistent um, in terms of content and reuse or purpose of reuse, because it matters who's in the footage and who's using it and who's watching it, right? And, and what those power relations are. I mean, if I might just ask a, a little follow up question, um, so there's a relationship between technology uh, and ethics. Uh, if, if you know, if we take the the example of the the, the queer um, television show and the queering of the supposedly queer television show, um, that kind of example is interesting because it's easy to do that if you have the kind of digital tools that we now have. Uh, you know, in a 60 millimeter world that would not have been possible in a classical television world that would not have been possible so the kind of the, the, the kind of potential to reverse the gaze has grown exponentially with digital technology it, it all, as has the, the potential for abuse but it's become much easier to to inscribe this kind of differential viewing into the material would you agree or oh yeah absolutely i mean i think you're right that it goes both ways right there's greater potential for you know, sort of actively ethical misuse, and there's also greater for potential for abuse, right? Um, I feel, you know, sort of, you can't have one without the other in a way. Um, but 
yeah, definitely there's, there's more potential. Although I will say that the, um, the, uh, humans and Vargas piece, one thing I love about it is that it's, uh, done in such a way that it's very low tech. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, sure they had, you know, editing software and everything, but, um, they actually make it very clear that, uh, you know, the, that, that it is an appropriation and they don't make it super slick or anything like that. Yeah. Like they're kind of foregrounding um, what they're doing. Which of course is also an, a strategy for avoiding legal trouble because uh, yeah. you cannot be mistaken for uh, somehow being involved in the original production. Well, and I think but, that's a really key issue that we, uh, I didn't touch on. Uh, well, maybe I did, but you know, I mean, that misleading an audience about the nature of the footage and the and of the appropriation, I think, is something that we're going to be dealing with more and more, right? Um, because obviously, deep fakes and uh, you know this audio software where you can generate speech that sounds like somebody, uh, you know, I mean, the, there's there's so much potential for abuse in you know of of both the original subjects and also of the audience um, in those technologies. So yeah. that's that's coming, right? I mean, it's already here, but it's going to... Right, and it's not just about author's rights, but it's about personality rights in, a, in an entirely new way. Right. Yeah. Um, we have another question from Dr. Christina Formenti, who uh, is, is from our um, partner university, Udine, and her question is about paratext, and I'm also going to read it, which is the role of the paratextual materials surrounding the film appropriating found footage, um, can they help make the appropriation less unethical? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, again, it depends on a given circumstance, but uh, I wrote about Scott Stark's film Speechless, um, in which he appropriates these, uh, they were, there were these images, these stereoscopic images of, of women's vulva, like close-ups of, of women's vulvas, and um, the first time I saw the film, it was a, it was submitted for the Festival of Inappropriation, the found footage film that I direct, or film festival, sorry, um, that I direct. And uh, the first time I saw it, I was just like, this is totally unethical. I can't watch this, you know, we can't program this. And then I read more about it and I figured out, you know, where the images came from and thought more about what he was doing with them and came to feel like actually it is a very ethical um, film. But if I hadn't had the extra textual knowledge um, that I gained after I watched it the first time, I wouldn't have understood it. Um, so I do think certainly for some films, uh, it's really important to have some extra textual knowledge. Uh, you know, there may be some that you don't need that for, um, but uh, particularly for experimental films where you don't necessarily know the origin of the footage initially, uh, it's really hard to evaluate the ethics of an appropriation when you have no information, right? You can kind of tell what the gaze, the original gaze might have been, um, but, you know, doing historical research around something, uh, you can, that can really change. And, um, you know, I wrote about also um, something like a, a film unfinished, uh, Yael Herzonsky's film, um, where you know there was the Nazi footage of the Warsaw Ghetto, and it wasn't until more footage was found that which became sort of like paratextual material, even though it was part of the original footage, that totally reframed the understanding of that original footage, which Herzonsky then builds on. Um, so you know there, there's always kind of more to know about. I mean not always, but there is frequently more to know about a given piece of footage that can change the way that we understand the ethics of the appropriation. Um, so again, that's another thing that's unstable here. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm always dealing with sort of instabilities, uh, uh, epistemological instabilities, I guess, uh, with my work, because, yeah, I think sometimes I learn something new about a piece of footage, and then the appropriation may seem either more or less ethical. We have two more questions, and I admit to having failed to relay the thanks of the questioners uh, for a great keynote. I'm formally doing that now for the next question, which is from um, Erika Meiden. Um, and again, I'm going to read it out just for the sake of precision. And I'm thinking about the strange configuration of US intellectual property law, which considers fair use of appropriated material to be dependent in part on whether it sufficiently reinvented the original so that it cannot reasonably be considered the same. 
This definition, of course, comes from the vantage point of commercial value more than ethics, but I'm thinking about how reinvention is different than a decontextualization as an ethical measure, or is it a different category altogether? Can you repeat that last part? Sorry, the... Well, is it is it a different uh, category altogether? I mean, this this goes to uh, uh, something we just talked about: the difference between um, author's rights and personality rights to to the image. And, and uh, so the, the the question is um, about the relationship of artistic reinvention and its commercial value, as opposed to ethical reconstruct uh, the ethics of recontextualization. Yeah, I mean, I. I mean, I, I fundamentally believe in, in, you know, well, first of all, changing intellectual property laws, but, um, you know, almost, almost every appropriation that I look at, to me, is a transformation, right? I mean, unless you're taking uh, an entire text and just rescreening it, or maybe, you know, I don't know, altering some teeny tiny little thing that doesn't change its meaning. Um, you know, to me, that is transformative. Um, I mean, I don't, you know, there, there's always this question of where that line is, like what exactly constitutes a transformation. So it's a very problematic law because it depends on this incredibly vague uh, description. And then you also have the, um, the, specification that satire is okay, right? Um, so if you can argue that something something is satire, well, then it's all right. Um, but the, the legal system is, I mean, at least certainly in the US, and I would imagine many other places as well, you know, just isn't equipped to really evaluate these things, right? And that, I mean, I'm hoping in a way that perhaps my book might offer scholar or legal scholars, like some maybe useful terminology, because um, I, I actually wrote about this one film uh, called Sarah Nicomas Weir by Brian L. Fry, who, wh who's, the film is really a reflection on, it's an appropriation film that's a reflection on how the legal system is totally incapable of evaluating its own use of video footage, right? Mm -hmm. Like they don't have the vocabulary for dealing with that. So um, I do think as film and video scholars, media scholars, like we, we need to do more to change the kinds of language that is used around this kind of material. But that being said, um, you know, I, I really think that the, the issues of ownership, like who owns a piece of footage, uh, is really usually irrelevant to the ethics, right? Um, you know, often it's not the people who are in the image who own the footage anyways, right? Um, and I, there is no clear, uh, I mean, except for one of the argument that I cited about the right to publicity, there is very little guidance about what's okay to do with a footage of somebody, you know, what their rights are. Um, and again, I, I don't know that there's an easy way to, define that, but I think it's important to not just uh, focus on, you know, who owns the intellectual property rights, because there can be plenty of abuse that is, you know, not a copyright violation. Exactly. I mean, I was just thinking that there's, there's an ample literature case history um, uh, of, of uh, cases pertaining to um, violations of copyright and author's rights. Um, and in the area that, that you're working on, um, you know, I, I'm not aware of much legal history, which has something to do with that the, the, these people don't sue and they don't sue because they don't have the money. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, if you're, um, if, if you're, if you're a minority in Canada and someone like Daniel comes along and makes that film, you could sue, but who's going to pay for it? Um, right. Access to access to the legal system is costly, particularly in the United States. So that that may explain the relative absence of cases. And that brings us back to power relations, right? Okay. I mean, that's the thing is that you know when it comes to copyright, the people who sue are these giant corporations, right? Uh, very occasionally, you might get somebody who's a private citizen, but yeah, you have to have you have to have means. Which, which makes your work all the more important because in a way it stands in for um, uh, the, the, the lacking legal representation. You don't have to sort of frame it as, a, as an ethical uh, debate. Mm -hmm. um, ethics, ethics are cheaper than law. <laughs>
right. <laughs> or affordable, so to speak. Uh, and we have another question from Perrine. Um, we're out of time, but I think we can afford to have this question uh, in conclusion of our, of our fascinating panel. Um, Perrine, again, thanks for the talk and asks, could you tell a bit more about the role played by the film archives and the potential misuses of images? How do the archives, uh, how can archives prevent it? Um, how do we deal with, um, how, how to face the cases where the archives do not let people access it or only through a very discouraging bureaucratic process? Can it be considered as a reappropriation? That's a really great question. It's something I'm interested in. I don't really have an answer to. I gave a talk a little while ago to the Canadian Archivists Association um, and somebody raised that point of sort of what archivists should do when they can see that somebody is looking at their materials or planning to use their materials for something that the archivist believes is unethical, right? Um, that is abusive in some way. And I hadn't even really thought about that, honestly, until um, she raised that issue. But it's, I mean, that that's a really interesting question about, you know, I mean, I, I you know, I was focused on filmmakers, really, and viewers, um, sort of, you know, what, what, what are the best practices for filmmakers, and then how can viewers make an assessment of, you know, of a film that, that appropriates material. Um, but I do think, you know, there, I don't know if it's specifically if there's a role for archivists to play, but I think it's an important question to ask, like, at what stage, you know, uh, whether it's like this thing with the the um, Cambodian genocide photographs, the Khmer Rouge photographs, uh, you know, there there is no way I'm I, I, there's no way to keep this this artist uh, artist uh, from um, getting those photographs. But what if there could have been right? Um, you know, like can we stop it before it happens? I don't know. I mean, I guess it becomes also a freedom of speech issue again. Um, and some people will not adhere to the ethics that, again, I think of, I think should be universal, but, you know, I don't, I don't get to decide. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I would be interested to hear what, what archivists think about that. I mean, there's an interesting case in Germany, the so-called Vorbeholz film, the, the, the Nazi propaganda films, which um, are withheld from uh, circulation. You can only screen them under certain conditions. Uh, you cannot appropriate them for documentaries unless, you know, you fulfill certain criteria. So that's a, a strictly regulated case where, independent of where the films are stored, um, the state has instituted a set of rules on how this material can be, can be accessed and used. But that's a very rare case. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, and that's kind of amazing that they've been able to keep it out of circulation, right? I mean, one thing with the, um, the Khmer Rouge photographs is that you know, now you can get a lot of them, I think, online, or they're in a, they're published in a book, so you can scan them, right, they're, they are accessible, so they can't be um, sort of contained in the same way, but it's, I mean, it's an open question about whether that's what we want, right, um, you know, I, I tend to feel like perpetrator footage should be treated very carefully, but who am I to decide what constitute, you know, uh, it's just, a lot of a lot of gray area there. Okay, the, I mean this discussion is far from exhausted, but um, we have a schedule to respect, and um, it's nine o'clock in Europe right now. We probably also have some flights to go to. Thank you so much, Jamie, um, well, for you. this great talk, for the wonderfully rich uh, discussion. Um, which was exactly what we hoped for and which is going to be very useful for our project going forward. Well, thank you so much yeah. for having me here. And although I can't see the audience, thank you for, for being here. Uh, if anyone wants to continue the conversation, feel free to email me. My email is on the University of Alberta website. So happy to talk more. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks to the audience. Thank you for the questions and uh, hope to be seeing most of you again tomorrow. Uh, for the second day of our conference. Thank you so much. All right, take care. Bye. Bye. And also, before we go, I want to thank the technical crew because I think they did an amazing job under the conditions in particular. Um, this worked out really well. Uh, very professional. Thank you so much. <laughs>